Welcome back to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing, and welcome to the second part of our practical lecture 6.1, Understanding OpenMP Parallel Programming. And in the first part, we really had extreme basics discovered from OpenMP. We reviewed a little bit shared memory, what that means with NUMA and CC NUMA and UMA, architectural constraints. And then we really looked a little bit into a C program and then extending this C program with compiler directives, the so-called pragma statements and sentinels in order to have let's say, very simple outputs parallelized. So that was something like hello world. Now in the second part here, we want to do much more things. We want to go to work sharing constructs, so for loops, etc. But also thinking about some critical elements when we have critical regions and things like thread private, where you basically then let some data across different, obviously beyond one parallel region exist. But we will have lots of demos on this. Um, and in the end, we will have also um, a review again of our HP DB scan algorithm that basically is also an open uh, MP programmed algorithm, at least in parts. We also have, of course, another part in MPI. And I will make the distinction and the points to that, um, alluding also to our lecture seven that will also then subsequently take on board this. OpenMP elements we learn here in this lecture and then bring it together with MPI in the hybrid fashion. So let's go for a very practical session here. Um, of course, the elements I show here, I actually have dis described much more in detail already in lecture six. So I will do this here much more quicker to have time for the practicals. We have seen the OpenMP work sharing constructs could be a couple of those, and I would like to at least, um, you know, demo here the for loop. We have seen that with a simple pragma statement in front of a for loop, you can achieve a fork of the master thread and so have different threads in parallel working on elements of the for loop. And that is the first one I really want to pick here as one of the demos for you. Um, the idea of doing data parallelism in this um, in this loops is, of course, very beautiful. Um, of course, it comes with some, you know, constraints. And one of that is basically that you see here, a constraint to be relatively nicely parallel in a way. So you see here um, that essentially the, the array that we basically multiply here with a constant uh, of another array has always a dependency basically with E. And with this basically has no dependency with every, any run before or any run after, etc. So this means we can nicely break it in two parts, right? That we already had in lecture six. So here it's very obvious that basically you can achieve the same end result of this AI where we are interested in here um, when you do it in one loop or you basically use it with two processes in two loops. And what I mean here is of course then two threads in the open, you know, basically open MP fashion with shared memory uh, doing then basically the writing and reading of the different values in shared memory on the specific integers uh, or indices really of E here. So for this, we had to review a little bit what that means when we came to this work sharing construct and what are basically the elements, how we can describe this. So let's have an advance for example here, which I would like to demonstrate to you a little bit now. So we have uh, the advanced for loop. We go to this example at the beginning and have a look at the uh, source code a little bit before we execute it. So we basically say we have here um, a loop that is basically where all starts from, from the inner, so to speak. And we want to have a for loop around it. We said we want to have this dynamic chunk and no weight, which reflects that whenever, uh, let's say, thread is already finished with its work portion, then you basically dynamically assign the next free worker or the next free thread for it. And static would keep the normal order, right? You see that also in my slides a little bit again, eluding here. Static keeps the order intact, but dynamic really means the first thread that is ready um, gets reassigned the rest of the array to work on. Obviously, um, when we go here, um, then into the idea of how to parallelize this, we would parallelize this in chunks. That's why the second aspect is basically this chunk, meaning 
basically how you break essentially this um, loop now into different chunks of chunk sizes. And the chunk is here defined, you see on a certain chunk size that you of course can define. Let's say, say we have an array of thousand here. And then the chunk size means like with 100 portions, we want to go through it, which essentially in my graphic here reflects these blocks that you see, right? So um, obviously um, we here again, as you remember from the first initial lecture, six and also our first part here of the practical lecture six one we don't really go into the business again and say now how many threads will be there so that's something what our job script will decide so this is basically scalable and of course you can imagine the chunk had some impact in this but the more basically threads we would have the quicker we can go through this but on the other hand of course the chunk has a certain amount of you know crunching this big um, array into smaller pieces and also constitute some limits here. But for the first example, I think it's pretty straightforward what this is doing. We have here a very nicely parallel way of add just two arrays to a third one over a loop of this whole array. So it's nicely parallel, what I already said in, in my statement before. That's beautiful. And no way just means when this is done, we just continue with our application. So no threat is waiting for the other. But on the other hand, we see that the program is anyway ending. So in this sense, uh, we, we put the threads to rest as soon as possible. And it's the end of the parallel region, as we know. So basically, then there would be anyway expected that this is just here with the master thread executed. Let's move one level higher from the parallelization point of view. You see, I start from the inner, where I see this here is now the parallelized for loop. And we defined how the chunks are working. But we also learned then in order to work, in this loop with E, I need a private E, so to really break this down for each of the different threads. So every thread has an own E variable. However, what I can share is, of course, a chunk size, which is this basically defined here element. And by the way, these are just some initialization of the arrays here to have some real numbers computed. And of course, I want to share our A, B, and C um, you know, basically array that I initialize here a little bit in order to have some computing done and the chunk size. And now here I want to do an overall Pragma OMP parallel block with this, you know, defined shared and private variables. And then of course here we want to get out how many threads were really working in this parallel region. So a very trivial example in a way, but of course it already shows you very much how you basically execute um, and work with OpenMP, also with a simple um, work constructs, really. Um, I don't do the uh, compilation again. You trust me that I have already compiled this. So just to save some time for more practicals. And here we have now eight threads working on it um, and basically ex export this also so that the parallel environment knows about this. So no surprises with all of these job scripts. And if we s fetch it, um, we basically have then job here in our QStat. And you can see here that I already started another job in preparation of our, let's say, end discussion here with HTTP scan OpenMP running already 17 minutes for a certain reason. I will come back later. But our simple job here is already um, done. Let's move to this and see what the output might be. You see here that's the 69. So let's see, it seems to be not written yet. So here's the 96, and we can go in the output where we now see there were really eight threads working then in this basically parallelization of then this loop. And basically this is the first little example. I wanted to show you how it is running. Obviously in assignment three, when you do this yourself a little bit, you will basically get some hands on and some changes to do there. Um, and basically all I would just describe is already here in the um, slide set. So I think we can already go to the next one, um, which is an interesting one because it is around the synchronization construct of critical regions. So this is something where we basically can see there's every now and then the problem of race conditions. That means when you have the source code here, um, we see Pragma and PPARL and you have a shared X variable. So basically everybody has access to this variable X. And let's assume you would have four threads rocking on this. 
at the same time, while I, you know, rewrite x by reading x plus 1. So this is, of course, obviously a problem because once people are reading x, there may be already other threads already writing to x a new value, but I just lost that because essentially here is no serialization on this aspect, right? We are all in parallel coming to that. And depending on if you're lucky or not, you basically get here completely funny different results because x is dependent on how you read x right now and is dependent of how quick the others have already wrote, wrote their part into x. So long story short, this is a critical region that we specifically have to protect. And I want to demonstrate a little bit how that works uh, in, in source code. So let's go to our, I think, critical example here. And I want to show it in two, two ways. Firstly, um, obviously, when we go to this, we could comment this out, right? You see here, this pragma statement is commented out. So for the compiler, here is no pragma statement anymore. So we run here into the situation that if you want to have this with four threads executed, everybody has directly access to the statement, will read and write at the same time, and we expect the mass and not, let's say, the number of four coming out of that. And, and of course, this is now something which is source code dependent, right? So we basically have to here then really make sure that we have the right, um, you know, um, kind of source code compiled. So let's compile here in this particular example, just to be sure that we have the right critical example here, which is now uh, basically one which has um, essentially a race condition problem. If I compile this, there would be some warning sets for the sake of this particular lecture here, not so important, of course, for making it more beautiful, one would think about it. And what we want to do is now use our jobs script and use four threads for it. And if you remember a little bit what the source code was about with four threads, we would expect somehow a four <coughs> basically coming out of this. But when we now aspect it, and you know, it could, will also be a very fast running job that is probably already completed. So in the 97, let's look on the output on the 97 here, you see three. So obviously there was some problem starting that x was zero and maybe before one could write the x zero plus one and then really write to memory the x is one already someone else was reading or some other thread was reading a zero although almost nearly it would have been a one and this is the idea of this race condition problems and why we need critical regions so let me change this in order to illustrate this um, we have discussed this endlessly also in <laughs> lecture six so i don't want to reiterate on to it on too much. I think here you have now the idea oops, um, that you basically have now a proper pragma um, statement within the pragma parallel region, which is executed by four. But this pragma OMP critical will ensure that just one thread at a time can execute this particular part. So it's a synchronization statement of sort. And then, of course, we give the number out. By achieving this, we, of course, hamper parallelization a bit, you can imagine. And by adding it also now, this pragma statement in, you can imagine we have to rerun our compilation because we changed this time really the source code. This is not about the number, if you see, it's not about the number of uh, threads I add here. Now it was really just compiling this pragma statement in so this, that we have now an executable that is a proper C and OpenMP code having this x equals x plus one properly saved and basically then marked as a critical region. Others would say it's a bit of serialization of sort. Um, basically, you see you have the 98 running, which means that by doing so, of course, we ensure that one thread at a time is there. So every thread has a chance to write, read and write x properly. And with this, we should probably now expect an output that is essentially then um, the correct output, which is probably four if it did all right. And you see here, number of x after region is four. I did nothing else and just commented in the pragma OMP critical uh, statement. I also kept the number of threads, of course, in the job script the same. And with this, we already have a correct answer. This was another 
basically um, idea. And did you see basically the thread number was also not there in the source code, also not in the previous source code. So we see here how we also can there achieve scalability. Coming back to these slides, um, all what I more or less said uh, again, and basically here for some screenshots, but also the explanation here again of X um, is basically in also this kind of fixed idea of commenting then Pragma OMP critical in. I think you get the story by this um, right now. And the next one I want to talk about is the so-called thread private that we had in lecture six. Um, and this is an interesting example because here we're talking about keeping data that we have basically in created in, let's say, in the first parallel region, also available at the second parallel region. And of course, this is something what normally would be falling apart because the threads will be basically after one parallel region joined again to the master thread, and then we lose the thread identity and everything. But here we have a mechanism to keep essentially the data across the different parallel regions alive. And I show you this a little bit in the source code because here in this one, um, basically you see it's a little bit shorter because just for the readability. So let's go into the real example with thread private. And Let's look at the source code a bit. It's a bit more longer, the source code, um, basically saying essentially what I discussed to you uh, before. Here we have the first parallel region, which is now important, and we have a second parallel region, uh, which is important. We also learned that basically the master thread will be continuous with the serial part. That's why the master thread is doing here some zero work, which whatever it is, uh, is not really of our interest, but we have clearly are interested that we have two parallel regions here. And the statement that we can do in Pragma in order to basically ensure that variables are basically um, available in the different parallel regions is this thread private variable I already explained in lecture six. And important for our demo here is that you notice that basically B is not involved in this red private. So we, we expect a problem here. And let us explain why a little bit. So obviously we get the thread ID here as usual from our OMP get num the thread num. Then we set A and B accordingly to these and let's say do some form of computation for X, which is just, you know, arbitrarily and really didn't matter as much now as this B. And you can see we do here an output and say the ABC, what the current um, essentially uh, values are, depending also on the thread number. Remember, if I now execute this with four or eight threads, um, four or eight threads will execute this. So in this sense, um, it's important for us maybe to understand that each of the thread will give that output A, B, and X. Um, after that, we have basically nicely now filled A and B with some information about the thread IDs and also X. And because A and X is here on top, actually, um, you know, indicator thread, thread private, these values for A and X, we're going to be staying, even if we're joining back essentially here the idea of the normal serial world and the TID and the, let's say, thread private, uh, the normal private variable for the threads, uh, B and TID will disappear. So that also means that we have to set TID again in the second, you know, basically um, parallel region, what we want to define. And basically see um, that here when we go now and just want to know what is the current situation of all the variables we have identified or set really in the in the first parallel region and you know print them out, which is a TID I just set new. So when I have new 12 threads, there will be different 12 thread IDs. But I also want to understand how A, B, X have been preserved or if they have been preserved. And we expect probably that with B we have a problem here. So let me show you how that then looks like. Um, obviously, we have a job script, and by now it's getting probably very boring for you to looking at this, and that's a good sign because essentially 
you see job scripts are often executed the same way you will steer here and there the number of tasks, the number of tasks per node, CPUs per task, etc. But the modus operandi largely stays the same. And, you know, basically here and there you would maybe add some SBatch um, statements to your um, computing. You see here a little bit, I prepared just shortly that you understand that SBatch can do much, much more. It has lots of options um, here and there, but the basic design um, of course, how you operate this job script and then execute your application with it is, of course, um, really something which, you know, stays or more or less the same. But of course, saying also when you come to production usage of HPC systems, which are really large and big, you have lots of lots of options, as you see here. So I go a bit quicker even through this now um, to show you this. And of course, the nice thing with this um, API or basically also description is that you can now take something like CPUs per task, which we just said, um, we can of course search it to CPU per task. Oops, wait a second. Uh, as is, yeah, CPUs per task. Yeah, sorry, CPUs per task. You have the description of exactly this command that we have here. And um, basically you see different other options just showing you a little bit the bigger picture, of course, that we use SBatch, more or less always the same. But if you're in, let's say, production level applications, here and there you have to add some things uh, to these elements. You have chain jobs and, and, and things like that. But for us, this is now all we probably want to have here. Um, so let's have a look to really SBatch this a little bit here um, and basically execute this in the meantime we want to look a little bit what our other job is doing here we have seen 31 minutes and the running of the openmp hbdb scan we will come shortly to and the thread private here is already completed M very mini tiny job so no big computing happening there and the output um, we have here the 99 so we assume the output will appear any moment yes the output and what we now expect is that actually in the second parallel region, our B would be missing. And that's exactly what you see here um, coming out. So we have the first parallel region, everything is proper. Uh, we define A, B, C accordingly. If you remember from the source code, um, you see also the usual race condition across the output, right? So not every thread is deterministic here and saying zero, one, two, three, but they basically compete for the output file but that doesn't matter for us any much. Uh, the important thing to take away is really that we have here in the first A, B and X, which was computed uh, properly defined. And because basically B was just a private variable and not a threat private variable, you see that in the second output here in the parallel region number two, um, essentially all values for B have been forgotten. And of course, this is something which uh, is, is sometimes just normal and uh, it just depends on the application if you really need the data again for certain aspects. But of course, if you need the data again, instead of recomputing now the X, for instance, or so again and again, which could be a really big physical formula, right? I mean, the, the context of this work is you have to always think these are not the simple examples that you see here. Normally you would do some interesting perhaps um, equation of physics, which really takes computational expensive time or in our local DB scan, which we will see soon to do some clustering computation expensive operations. And with this, you basically have, of course, here the, the um, complicated aspect of parallel programming. You have to integrate the application code um, while here we just play around with some printf statements and simple assignments of variables. Of course, the production world, which we have done in the second part of our lecture series, right, starting with lecture 10 and so on, where we dive into the scientific applications and how they use MPI, OpenMP and so forth. Good. So um, essentially, this was this part. And you see, again, um, many of these things have been already discussed in lecture six, so I don't need to re-explain them, I guess. A lot here, but you see the effect is really happening in practice when we do the execution of source code. Even here, we have a more advanced example, um, basically in more ways than one. Firstly, it's perhaps interesting for you to know that you can break this 
uh, statements into different lines just for readability that might be interesting. And you see here one particular one, which is a bit familiar to you from the MPI sphere again. And you see that's why we have this parallel um, kind of programming paradigm. So this reduction operation reduce is always a very specific one, which is often used. And if you remember in MPI as well, we had certain operators where we can, you know, pick from not only here as we do a plus in addition of all the result values happening across this loop, um, you can also multiply and do simple other operations. Um, let us explain this a little bit and we can go for this, of course, in the source code again in order to make it and execute it. So i clear here a bit and see where we are. So the reductions clause here is what we want to show now. So let's go to the C code a little bit. Um, here we would have now uh, in a basically simple um, yeah, initializations, really not so important. We have our chunk size again, which would be a bit important for our schedule, if you remember. Here, it's maybe interesting to see that we have the static chunk scheduling. Um, in other words, you see that here, it keeps the proper order of the threads intact uh, while working on this loop. And this is all just one statement for this loop, right? I think that's sometimes misread by students remembering from old lectures. So this is not uh, basically for, for everything here. It's just in front of this particular loop. It looks a bit funny because of this breaking character here in order to make it a bit more readable. But essentially what we do is just a pragma OMP parallel for this for loop, as it, the name suggests here. As usual, we have our um, private E variable that governing the index here. We have the static and chunk ordering. And uh, essentially here we have the A and B arrays we're interested in basically to multiply here, which is a nice operation because it's essentially our index here on our way. But you notice one difference to the previous parts also, which means in order to do so, we want to have the result added in each of these runs, what is easy to do if you do it, let's say in one loop, but remember now that we break this loop maybe into four threads, into eight threads, into 16 threads, we don't know. And with this, we basically, of course, thinking about that um, all other threads maybe don't really see this result. And with this, we want to do a reduction clause so that everybody from all the threads, the results are included in one or reduced to one, as we would say, to run result, right? So what we expect this year then, that there will be a number coming out um, out of this, which is, you know, large enough that this could be having computed from all the threads together. So let's go there a little bit into the submit reduction clause. Also here, no surprises. Um, we keep four threads in the moment. Um, basically, I already had in the first part of this lecture uh, already shown that we can easily here increase to eight or 16 and essentially then the, um, the program will also work without actually compiling the code. So let's espatch it a little bit with the submission, with the submit script here. By now, we see interesting enough that the HPDB scan is finalized. So that's also something I want to show you in a moment. That means around half an hour, there was this job finishing and we will make a case for it, why it took so long and what is actually the output of this. But let's stay here in this sphere first. You see that was the 200 job um, here at the end. So more slurm, et cetera, to 100. And we see there's just fun final result nicely reduced in all of these loops across all the different threads. And this is, of course, a nice um, way of making it a little bit easier with the parallelization and letting the parallel environment know this is kind of compiler directive where we're interested in, in adding up. And this is then included into the statement um, re and reducing it automatically. So that's what I also explained to you now here in the slides. I just want to also take the opportunity already to come back to our clustering algorithm. 
there here, I would like to have a couple of more elaborate points uh, because we also will pick up in the next lecture, it, but also we can connect to the previous one where we already have used HyperDB scan with MPI. And of course, it will be part of our lecture uh, of our assignment three. Um, many of these OpenMP elements, including HPDB scan, and the clustering will be also explained in later lectures. So don't worry that you don't understand the extreme details of this DB scan algorithm. It's also not necessarily required in this course. Important is to understand the major concept here that clustering brings together data points, as I already said before in some lectures, which have a certain similarity measure very close to each other. As an example here, Euclidean distance would show you these points are together. These points are together because they're just closer together. Now, essentially, when you map this to, to real points, we have discussed this also before, um, then you have, let's say, very interesting, funny effects of different um, settings where the points might be. So suggesting domain decomposition here just at the middle would be very bad to do because here one domain would have hell a lot of points and the other domain here on the processor too has nothing to do. So splitting the points, estimate splits um, and so on and merge halos then if you have different processors and MPI was one of the interesting part of these algorithms. Now reflecting on what this lecture is today, we don't have MPI, we don't have distributed memory, we don't distribute points, right? Be sorting them still, but distributing not. In other words, we stay local, Right, so when we're staying local, we do a local DB scan in the local environment, which is pretty fast because we can read and write to memory instead of you know merging all these halos together. On the other end of the scale, you would say, although we are very nice and fast in local DB scan in our memory, the problem we're facing is that our memory is limited. So when you think about Bremen, and we had this different data sets, if you remember Bremen and Bremen Small, Bremen small is not a problem, but if you have larger problems with Bremen and other point clouds, um, then you're quickly running perhaps out of memory just to have all the points you know, loaded in order to perform a local DB scan. Hence, we discussed before that pay people really use you know, OpenMP together with MPI in order to achieve these scalings here with hybrid instead of just using MPI. And you can imagine we're not really thinking about usually in production to just basically use it with, with OpenMP alone. Right here, the idea of OpenMP is just a little bit to show you that it's possible, of course, um, if it fits to memory. But on the other hand, of course, for real production run, it makes no sense to have an OpenMP or shared memory alone, because usually the problem size is so big that it basically needs more memory than just one node can provide. And neuroscience might be an actually a very good other example where you have very, very high resolution images from human brain cuts. And basically there you also very quickly running out of memory if you stay, let's say in the OpenMP space with shared memory. However, of course, um, for this example here, just to show you that we use the same ideas um, that I was alluding to before, we, we load here and if you go to the official HPDB scan file, uh, we load here the OpenMP, you know, we also work with HDF5. I demonstrated this in one other practical lecture. Then here the OMP, basically you have the same pragma statements we already know, schedule, dynamic. We have private variable discussing. Um, we do a reduction of uh, certain elements. And, you know, basically the totality details is not so important for you. It's a very obvious, complicated code that you also don't need to understand in details, but you see that I use here in the code and Marcus was implementing this, one of my PhDs that graduated a long time ago here at the university. But basically um, he is you know, using and reusing many of the things that is basically in OpenMP and also shows us that you can sometimes even you know, set the number of threads variable, um, which is also interesting. Um, what we had discussed before, because usually it's already set here in the environment. And essentially now when you would execute this with four threads, um, we would stay obviously with this four threads in this local debut scan area of this algorithm. So no merging of halos, no distribution of points um, and no, no point in this. And in order to basically um, show you the results a little bit, I already executed this particular job 
uh, before I started this recording because obviously I've seen half an hour take some time. Um, and when you come back to the results here, you will see that this was actually nicely executed. So let us go to the um, element here. Um, I can also, of course, start a new uh, P DB scan, open a P. Um, here we have this particular one and just reflecting a little bit what that means. You know, already we have this module load, HP DB scan. Um, we basically load the HDF5 and other, let's say, environmental elements that we need for this application. And with this, we have the executable, which is important for us. We specify the wall time here for two hours, but really don't need it with 16 threads. And with 16 threads executing it, um, we have been successful. I just will do another run, but of, obviously we don't have another half an hour in this lecture. It doesn't matter. Just to show you here the outcome of this um, here in the example where we have probably here in this one already the um, kind of result that came out of the job that we executed before. And of course, because we have um, not an MPI version now that we use, we don't use more than one process, right? We don't distribute points. We don't do MPI. And obviously, on the other hand, we also don't do the merging of the halos of the neighbors and so on. So this, that's why this time is simply zero. Um, as of course our open and, you know, shared memory suggests, we get the same results on Bremen small. And have around, if you calculate this by the divided by 60, around half an hour really how it was running. So that was nice. And of course, now you see QSTAT again running with this job. And I cannot really finish that. And I don't want to really show you this point in time. Just say you another example here on the slides where I did some time ago, but the results are basically the same today. You see, when you would execute the same. Um, and then just with four threads, essentially, and you specify example one hour, you would run against the wall. And by this, you would see that this mechanism against the wall will run much better than you have experienced in assignment one, because this is a long running job. And then after an hour, um, you know, you see basically it will not achieve the job. It just simply has too little threads, too little parallelization to really work on this, too little computing power, really. To, to achieve this in one hour and then we're running against the wall. Increasing, however, then to this, as we said, 16 threads by still being on one node still makes a big difference. And this is something what is an important takeaway message and what you can always, let's say, look on the, you know, S control, which I also want to show you a little bit just as a demo here. Always remember we had this interesting S control job ID command which is sometimes nice, for instance, here in the uh, minus DD, you have more output. And let's say we take the one that I'm just here computing, um, you get more information about the job. Um, and also seeing here that we are on compute to zero, we have basically 16 tasks um, executing here. And with this basically stay in, you know, just one node. And this is what we also expected when we have the job script here. The job script is again, let's say copied for convenience and so forth. We also see that here, um, probably we already see some initial output. You, this was a 201, if you remember job ID. If you go more deeper in this 201, you see that output has been partly written and that we are basically stuck now in this local scan, which means we now the computation intensive part takes place of, you know, clustering the results. And of course, in assignment three, you will basically see that um, on, on your own pace, you will experiment with this a little bit too much. And always remember now, this is a little bit more or less a toy problem coming also maybe shortly back to the slides here, right? So in production, of course, you would see of making this hybrid, increasing the number of nodes, increasing with this, the overall threat possibility and also the memory capacity that we can throw on this problem and this achieving then also better times than we have here with you know 30 minutes with 16 threads and think about this what happened with big data right this was small data in bremen what happens with big data um, if you have maybe the big data set of bremen um, you can imagine this would be maybe having a problem with memory for instance 
just to say that, of course, subsequent lectures will also debug this a little bit, but also be giving you possibilities after we have learned about the hybrid um, that we can also, of course, look into these threads. We can look in the variables they provide. However, we have the specific performance analysis tools because what you will see now with PS here, things you maybe know from Unix, doesn't help us very much, right? Because essentially you can here and there tweak it and use it. But here we are on the login node um, of YouTube, right? Which means um, here the job is not running. If you remember the S control um, I had here above, the job was running on compute 0 0.2, right? So we need something which takes in account the difference between compute nodes and login nodes. We need the specific tooling to identify patterns of in inefficient behavior of these variables and processes and methods. And this will be something we talk in lecture eight. And this, of course, a bit related to what we do today with OpenMP. And uh, then basically to, to also elaborate that we, of course, look a little bit more into OpenMP when we look in his successor, so to speak, for GPUs, which is called OpenEC in lecture nine then, because the simple ideas of parallelization with this kind of pragma statements is, is a very convenient way of doing a parallelization in the loop. So the question is, can we not do similar things by just basically specifying pragma for accelerators, uh, basically instead of shared memory in order to do here copy out, for instance, to the device memory or so, and, and talk about this a little bit more than, of course, in lecture nine. And this is all I wanted to, yeah, basically show you here as a demonstration live um, here, more or less in this recording. And basically we'll have your hands on in assignment three and we continue with lecture seven and picking up on this hybrid programming. See you then.